Okay, our speaker today is Franz Cronier. He's a medical doctor. So, Dr. Franz, I welcome you, and um, we look forward to this session. Well, it's a little bit like the story of the uh, Christian that's thrown to the lions, and the lions storm on him, and he says something to them, and they all lie down listlessly rolling over. And uh, they take him out of the arena, everybody greatly disappointed, and they say, well, what did you do? Did you renounce it? Did you pray to them? Did you speak in the name of Jesus? What did you do? He says, no, I simply said, after the meal, there will be speeches. <laughs> so so I, I hope that's not the way that you feel about this part, but it really is a privilege to be here. And, uh, and I'd just like to ask uh, the Father through the Holy Spirit just to be here and just to anoint my lips and open your heart so that you will receive what you needed to receive today. I really stand in His service. And Father, thank you for these opportunities. Thank you for the way in which you just plan these things. And we stand back and marvel at your ability to bring people together and to just plan and straighten the ways. And we submit to you. And I humble myself before you and I lay down any earthly credentials because I know that you are our highest and the greatest, and uh, we're just so grateful to be able to partner with you in this. Well, let me talk about spiritual roots of disease, and I'm going to start off by saying that there is a lot in Scripture about disease, an extraordinary amount in Scripture about disease. But what frustrated me as a doctor and a scientist looking at the science was that I could not see that which the Bible was saying somehow brought into the realm of science. I, I couldn't join the dots. I was living in two worlds. I was seeing patients Monday through Saturday, and I was in church on Sunday, and the two worlds didn't connect. And then when I went to church on Sunday, hearing about what God had to say about His people and His provision for health and life at abundance through the death of Jesus, I didn't see any difference in the church. The people were as sick. They were undergoing the same medical procedures. And I just thought there was a total disconnect. And I think what I r really need to say today is that we have become very schizophrenic about our views about disease. I mean, we're all sort of afraid of them. And then ultimately, we probably acquire them. And then we sort of have this love-hate relationship with my diabetes and my ingrown toe, and, you know, we sort of own it. And then we have this weird theology that we need a disease to die, okay? Now, the apple doesn't need to rot to fall from the tree. We have more than enough ability to wear ourselves out without needing a heart attack to die. Or the other thing that we often hear is, the, well, God gave me this disease to draw me closer to Him. But then how dare you go to the doctor to heal you, you know? We, we're just so schizophrenic about these, these things that we do. So I think the initial message I want to leave with you is that it is, and we know that we don't always reach God's perfect will, but I want to assure you, medically, physiologically, and biblically speaking, that it is God's perfect will for you to be in health. It really is. And secondly, our bodies are trying to get our attention. And you know what? As parents, we know that we train our children, and there comes a time where one particular issue is now the issue. It's now the time they need to pick up their clothes from the floor. It is now the time that they need to learn to put things away. We know that. Well, I want to tell you today is that is what our bodies are trying to tell us when we have disease. It's now the time to deal with this issue. But we have thought of it only as being a physical affliction for which we have pursued chemical, surgical, or other sort of mechanical solutions. And I want to introduce you, I hope today, to the language of the body, which is consistent not only with Scripture, but the other aspects of our existence, our soul and our spirit, and really give you a vocabulary and understanding that is a tool that you can apply in your ministries and the people you work with. I really want to empower you. Rather than what medicine often does, we hog all the information, and you're then dependent on us to administer it to you at a price. 
I don't want to do that. In fact, I want to repent on behalf of science and on behalf of medicine for often being a distraction and often being a barrier to the truth behind what has happened. And I hope we can start reversing that today. I'm going to cover quite a broad range of topics. And uh, I already want to reassure you, we'll make this available as a soundtrack. And in fact, what I'll do is I'll actually combine it with the slides and we'll put it on the internet and you can download it and listen to it and share it with your congregations if you wish to do so. So don't get writer's cramp. Don't uh, go into this, oh, well, this is too much. I know it's too much, but I have to fit uh, it in uh, to the extent that I can. But consider this a deposit in the body of Christ, and I hope that it will bless you and the people who you serve. So, let's start off with the first one. What is normal life and health? Well, the secular definition of health is this. The slowest possible way in which to die. Okay? But that, that is not God's definition. God's definition has to do with quality of life, with the ability to reproduce. In fact, the scientific definition of life is two things. It is the ability to reproduce and it is the ability to create order. And you know what? That is the characteristic of light as well as life. God is truly magnificent. But we are called to reproduce in spiritual or physical senses, and to create order, to keep. Those were the first commandments that he has given to man. And science bears that out too. And we are within relationship with God, ourselves, and others to have an existence, have an existence that is helpful, is a way to reflect the way we were truly meant to be. And this is by summary of Scripture, that we are meant to have a full life with all its seasons to glorify our Creator through a personal relationship, to bless others, particularly the next generation, and to end our life in a dignified way after a wholesome contribution to others. That is the blueprint for life. Now, thank you. What is the cause of disease? Well, I'm going to give you a couple of orientations here, and I'm going to start off with what science says. Science says we look at things that make you sick, things that make you vulnerable to disease, and the way in which the combination of those two produce disease. Once this thing grows horns and a tail, or in a sense symptoms and signs, we then call it a particular label, and we then develop strategies to deal with it. And there are two global strategies. Allopathy, which is what conventional medicine represents, say, uh, or says, you have a runny nose, so I'm going to give you something to block the runny nose. That's allopathy, so I'm opposed against the disease process. Homeopathy says, you've got a runny nose, so I'm going to mix up a very infinitesimal amount of something that would make your nose run so that your body opposes it and your nose dries up. Now here's the weird thing, both work. So clearly that can't be the whole story. Now, for the past 30 years, we've started to recognize things like deadly emotions. In other words, we know, and Caroline Leaf has done a wonderful job in South Africa also, showing about how what we think may produce disease. And medicine has caught on board, and I'll talk about this a little bit later. But we don't really know what to do with that. We don't always understand the mechanisms, although I'll share some of them with you so that you've got some facts. But who do we farm these problems out to? Well, for the most part, the church does not take care of them. They send them to people that use the views of atheists or scientists from a purely secular point of view to supposedly give skills to the body of Christ to live a life in abundance without the application of Scripture. So it is a very, very difficult situation. Or the psychiatrists that largely still treat it as a chemical problem. And yes, there is relief in that, but it isn't the full truth. And there isn't complete freedom. Now, the point is, where do these deadly emotions come from? And the, the point is that we know, as believers, having the Word of God, that there is something upstream. But what is upstream? And who's dealing with things upstream? Well, theoretically, it's the church. Theoretically, it's the pastors. But for the most part, practically speaking, pastors have, other than anointing with oil and the prayer of faith, felt that they have lost any authority in the area of disease. 
because they do not see how you get from there to there. Because for the past 400 years, science has said it's not sin, it's bugs, it's mutating cells, it's DNA, it's something else, it's got nothing to do with sin. It's science, and therefore you have a Prozac deficiency, you have a this deficiency, you have a that deficiency. And that's the reason for your disease. What I hope to do today is to turn this right around and to bring it back to where both science and religion have a proper perspective. Now, science is summarized in this slide. This is the story of the drunk man standing next to the street lamp in the middle of the night, looking for something. A boy comes up to him, says, what you doing? He says, I lost my keys. So he spends half an hour helping him look for them. And after half an hour, the boy turns to him and says, are you sure you lost them here? The man says, oh, no, no, I lost them in the dark alley over there. But everybody knows that you can't find your keys in the dark. The point of it is... Science is looking where the light is, not where the keys were lost. And I hope today I can show you where the keys were lost. I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver, which is why I defer to the Word of God to really speak into these things. But I really hope I give you a fresh perspective today. God's view on disease is that if we listen and do and obey His principles of life, Health is the natural consequence. And that is the message of the gospel. The good news is the word basar, which is literally flesh. The good news is that restoration. Jesus in the New Testament takes it a step further when he heals the man who was paralyzed and he says to him, after the debate with the Pharisees, well, what's easier, to say your sins are forgiven or you're healed, stand up and walk? So he very clearly makes this relationship between sin and disease. There's the man at the bath of Bethesda, shrouded in self-pity, feeling guilty about a sin that you only understand a little bit, little bit later. And Jesus says to him, do you want to get well? And I can tell you today that self-pity and people trapped in the identity of their disease is one of the toughest nuts to crack. If people don't want to get help, they cannot get helped. And this is the model for that. We really see that every day. But a few verses later, we see this where Jesus finds that man that he's just raised as a paralytic, and he says to him, See, you are whole now. Sin no more, lest a worse thing overcome you. So he clearly makes the relationship between sin and disease. Now, of course, with our Greek-Roman mindset, we always look at the exception, and we say, Aha, you see, that's not the case. And what we typically do is we turn to the issue of the man who was born blind. And we say, well, you know, in this case, Jesus spoke to his disciples and they had seen this pattern for three years, sin, forgiveness, health, sin, sickness, forgiveness, health. They've seen this for three years. So they see this scenario, this man is born blind, and they immediately say, okay, well, let's figure this one out. Jesus, did this person sin or did his parents sin? Can you see the pattern? They're not invalidating the pattern. They're saying, how does that pattern that is true apply in this unique situation? We use the exception to abolish the whole theology of sin and disease. And Jesus' response is, that's not the point of this. The point of this is that this man's restoration, mind you, not his deficiency, his restoration is going to show that I'm the Messiah. That's the point of his life. We don't measure the point of our life halfway. We measure it at the end. And that was the point that he was making. Don't look at the disease. Look at what will be done in this through healing, through restoration. That's the one point I want to make. The other one is this was not a healing. This was a miracle. It's a different class. It's a different class of issues. If we look at the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we have the gift of healing and the working of miracles. This was not a healing. This was a working of miracles. Different category. And there's an additional truth that I want to share here. Apart from that, there is precedent within the Word of God for genetically inherited disease. Now, the word curse, of course, is unpopular in Christianity. If you look at the meaning of the word curse, it means a lessening of the blessing. Well, I want to tell you that a premature death, the inability to have children when it is your desire to have them, poverty and all these other things are decidedly a lessening of the blessing. 
and therefore meet the biblical definition of what a curse is. The fact that we have made it fancy, given it all kinds of funny Latin names, does not detract from the original scriptural principle, nor the solution in Christ. But we want to take it to Monday morning in the reality of today, and I hope that I can contribute to that. The other thing that I want to say is that all unrighteousness is not biologically equivalent. Now, now think about that. All unrighteousness is not biologically equivalent. Let me explain it um, using an example in a family. If your child knocks over a glass of milk, you are going to treat it differently and the consequences will be different to them deliberately setting the house on fire or murdering someone or becoming so tormented in addiction that you can no longer live safely with them. Can you see? It's all unrighteousness, but the consequences are vastly different. Yes, we all have sinned. Yes, we all fall short of the glory of God. Yes, in terms of eternity, we have no right to salvation, but He gives it to us as a gift. But in this world, sin and unrighteousness is not biologically equivalent. Now, how can I say that? Well, I can say that because God says so. In Exodus 34, where he declares his own identity, which is a beautiful prayer that the children of Israel really learnt firsthand from God, he distinguishes iniquity, transgression, and sin. Iniquity, transgression, and sin. Now, for the Afrikaans-speaking people, it's tricky because the new translations have used ongerechtigheid as iniquity. But iniquity, as I'll explain in a moment, is really something else. And the closest I could get was an old Dutch word, which is snootheid. Snootheid. Snootheid, oortreding in sonde. So let me explain what they are. What is iniquity? Iniquity is perversion, twisting, or deviation in your nature. In other words, the person has now started habitually practicing something contrary to God's word, which is what Paul says. He says, those who habitually practice this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So that means your nature has now become twisted by sin. Scriptural reference in Isaiah 5, it's the people who call evil good and good evil. In other words, you've lost the plot. You've lost the plot. And that is not something that's forgiven in the sense that it's covered by the blood of Jesus. That needs to be changed. It needs to be changed. This was the Azazel. This was wilderness time. This is time to change. This is not just covered and it's okay. Different category. Okay. Transgression. Transgression is where you know it's wrong and you do it anyway. In fact, in the Hebrew, there's Fesha and Pesha. Fesha is Pesha's, okay, all right, so that is defiant transgression, okay, and those, those were summary judgments. If you, prior to the, the death on the cross, if you committed transgression, game over, okay, and defiant, that was completely game over. Now, the point is here, if we are committing those, it has a different or requires a different response. We need to say, I am so sorry. I have a change of heart. I am going to now behave differently so that you can see I am truly sorry. We expect that from our children. God expects that from us. It's not just, sorry, didn't mean it. Okay? It's not that situation. We need a true change of heart. Mistakes or sin. This is where the negligence comes in, where we didn't know who God really was and we weren't paying attention and we didn't take it seriously. That's what missing the mark or sin means. So there the, are those three levels. Now in the same verse, we've got this nasty little footnote at the end that says, not completely cleansing the guilty and visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children. And we sort of, when we read this, God merciful and loving, and that is a, not completely getting the guilty and you know, we sort of feel we almost want to apologize on behalf of God. But let me show you the mercy that is wrapped in this. God can not completely cleanse the unrepentant. Meaning, if the person does not truly say they're sorry, show it by trying to make amends. And living up to that, not in guilt, but compelled to correct their oversight. And 
pursue God's forgiveness. This cannot be reversed. Paul mentions that when he says, the one who steals should steal no more, but find something useful to do with his hands so that he may feed the poor. Okay? So change. Change what you did that was wrong. Visiting the iniquity. Now, perhaps that's the toughest one. What on earth would be merciful about visiting iniquity upon children and children's children? Well, the mercy is this. By right, the person who had deviated completely from God's character deserved to be completely destroyed immediately. But instead of allowing that to happen, God chooses to oversee the consequences of sin on the children within a living generation so that they may look upstream and downstream and say, God, help me. I want to change. I want to change and come back to you. And that is the purpose of this. And we read that in Ezekiel. It requires a renunciation of the past. It requires a deliberate change. And then the son will not die because of the sins of the father. Okay. Different categories of sin. So important we see that. Okay, but so what? There are different levels of unrighteousness. So what? Well, Jesus says they have different effects. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Different effects. In fact, without dwelling on Isaiah 53, you can see the different categories. There's kill, steal, and destroy in relation to transgressions, kill, iniquities, crush, and sins, steal. Summarized, let me put it in modern language. The omissions and carelessness reduces our quality of life because we deviate from the will of God so His promises are not fulfilled for our lives. Sin steals. Transgression kills, and we see that in the form of premature death. And iniquity, a twisted nature, destroys. It destroys individuals, destroys their genetic code, destroys their families, communities, and countries. That is where steal, kill, and destroy comes in. All sin is not biologically equal. If you find that a little bit theologically shaky, let me prove it to you from Scripture. In the book of 1 John, there's a reference. If any man sees his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he, and in fact this is the individual praying for him, shall give him life for a sin that is not unto death. Meaning, you made a mistake, you're sorry, you bring it before God, you are prayed for, and that can be covered. You see, that's in the sin category. It's not in the transgression or iniquity category. But he says, there is a sin unto death. I do not say that you should pray for it. Why? Because if someone is deadly ill, you shouldn't pray for them? That's not the point. The point is, then it's in a different category. This doesn't require prayer only. It requires something else. And we'll talk about what that is. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Different classes of sin. Diseases are not random. But how do we get from the Garden of Eden to ICU? Okay. What I need to do now is to take you on a little bit of a journey to give you a fresh view at our construction. I'm covering a lot of material. I know this morning it's after breakfast. Maybe your mind is somewhere else. But I really hope I can deposit this in your lives and in your spirit today because it will give you a perspective I know that God's truth will ultimately be the tabernacle and there's such wealth and richness there. This is probably just the first step away from the Greco-Roman linear sort of thinking into a broader cohesive model. So I immediately want to tell you this is provisional, but I hope it's that first step that will allow you to start dialoguing with people. So how do spiritual problems link to physical disease? Well, let's look at what happens in the Garden of Eden. We know there's this interaction, snake, woman, fruit, and consequence. Consequence, they realize they're naked, and they have the manifestations of fear, of guilt, and of shame. This is so important. Their response is to hide and to make fig leaves. Now let me show that to you in modern theology. 
after the fall, after a poor choice driven by desire, which we may cover a little bit later, we are now vulnerable to fear, guilt, and shame. Our response to fear, guilt, and shame is very specific, and let me show them to you one by one. In fact, all negative experiences in life I can summarize as a threat, an offense, or an insult. You can think about it. Something's either going to make you afraid, make you angry, or make you embarrassed. Usually combinations of those, but those are the three buttons. Now stay with me. What do we do in response to fear, guilt, and shame? Well, let's start off with fear. What do we do when we feel insecure? We find something that will offer us security. And if that's not God, that is an idol. Idolatry, occultism, is rooted as our response to fear. Doesn't matter whether it's an insurance policy, barbed wire, medical aid, doesn't matter what you're doing, and I'm not saying those are bad things, I'm saying why are we doing them? And I tell you that half of our daily motivation is fear-based. <gasps> I'm going to be late, I might lose my job, I'm going to disappoint this person, this, that and the other. We use fear to drive ourselves and that must change. But I digress, I'll get back to that. So the response to fear is raising up idols. What do we do because we experience guilt? Something's wrong. Well, like our teenage children, we go into rebellion. We become angry. We become hostile. We become bitter. We become accusing. And what do we do because we've lost the glory we once had? What do we do because we have the sense that something was stolen? Well, you know what? If I can't be as good as I believe I should be, I should at least be better than the person next to me. And we call that pride. So the fruit of fear is idolatry. The fruit of guilt is rebellion. And the fruit of shame is pride. Now I'm going to build this up a little bit further. Hang in there with me. So that's our fig leaf. Idolatry, rebellion, and pride. And you can take it from Genesis to Revelation. You will see the themes. Ten Commandments all the mitzvot, all the way through to the Sermon on the Mount, to Revelation, you will see that God says, in response to the fear that even Jesus experienced, don't go into idolatry. When you are in the wrong, don't rebel, come back to me. When you suffer humiliation, don't raise up a life for yourself. Humble yourself. And we'll get to that at the end. That's what His Word says. Now let me bring this to you in the fractal or this pattern, the snowflake of life. And the word of God's a bit like lasagna. I, I, a friend of mine told me this and, you know, it's, the pattern is simple. as simple that a child can understand it, but you can dig deep into it and it's rich and it's textured and it's probably laden with cholesterol. But anyway, the point is that the word of God has this capacity. Now let me share you the magnificence, the magnificence of God. And I don't want to put God in a box today, so don't think when I refer to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as a pattern, I'm reducing, diminishing God in any way. What I'm saying is there's this master, beautiful pattern of collaborative love. And we have all kinds of renditions of it, because God says, let us make man in our image. And we hear that that is spirit, soul, and body. So we see the manifestation of God's image in many ways, but amongst others, we see it in the formation of a triune being, man, that is spirit, soul, and body. Now, that's the master pattern. But look at how fascinating this is, because, you know, if we look at the soul, body, and spirit, they have different triunities too. And please hang in there for just a moment longer. Let's look at the soul. All of us recognize that our soul has at least three functions. We have the ability to think, we have the ability to decide, and we have the ability to feel emotions. We recognize that within the level of the soul. But you know what? In the level of the spirit, we have the same three themes. As Watchman Nee says in a beautiful book called Spiritual Man, he shows that we have the capacity to have a relationship with an invisible creator. 
That's not rational. That's above the level of the reason. When we were here worshiping this morning and we were overwhelmed, what was being overwhelmed? Our spirit man that was able to engage the all-encompassing beauty magnificence of God. That's above the level of the reason. So we have the ability for communion. We also have conscience, which is essentially above the level of the will, able to discern good and bad, right and wrong. In fact, we have arguments with ourselves. So, you know, if they're not two parties, who's talking? So we know there's another function. And then, of course, we have intuition, right? We have the sense, sense of something. And, and women are richly laden with this because they're relational beings. They're relational beings. They're very spiritual beings. They were designed to be that way. They were designed. I want to, I want to honor the women by saying Ezra Konegdo is a war ally. It's not barefoot pregnant in the kitchen. It's a war ally. It's Psalm 121. Where does my help come from? That's the word, Ezer Konegdo. Okay. Anyway, so let's move on. Now, I got very excited at this point because I could see... Oh, yeah, why not? Go for it. Yeah, and I have my wife, Lucy, and she's definitely my Ezra Konegdo. Absolutely. Now, we're going to give you the honor in him, not to me. <laughs> Now, when I saw the three in the soul, three in the spirit, I got very excited. And I thought, well, hold on, then there must be three in the body, right? And I was stumped for a while. Until one morning, and Lucy will remember this, Psalm 139 bubbled up and I said, Oh, yes, we're woven together. We're woven together. And I suddenly realized that indeed, in embryology, we're woven together. And I'm going to share that with you so that you understand the threeness of who we are. This is a little video clip that should play. Yes, that's a fertilized human oven. And it's dividing, it's going down the fallopian tube. This is by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. I mean, this is well-known medical uh, information. So it's dividing, that's the wall of the uterus. It's now going to plant in. And as it does, it separates in an inner cell mass, which by the way is what they use for stem cell therapy, uh, which is very questionable ethically, but that forms the whole human. But that's not the end of the story. This whole inner cell mass divides into three layers. And this is the key. The first outer layer forms the brain, skin, and nervous system. That's where information travels. It forms the middle layer. That's ectoderm, by the way, the outer layer. It forms the middle layer, which is the muscles and the heart and kidneys which is what determines behavior, blood flow, cells moving, and endoderm, which is our lungs, gut, and liver, which is where our energy comes from, in the sense of oxygen, nutrients, and our endocrine system producing hormones. So there's the, pr there's the pattern. We've got information, signals, communication with others and internally. We've got things that move, Right? The big things, the cells, the muscles, the body that moves. And we've got the part that provides energy and nutrition and substance. Lungs, intestine, liver, and endocrine system. So they're the three. I'm going to drill it out a little bit more so you can see it more than once. Ecto, outside, meso, middle, endo, endoderm. And they parallel. And there they are again. That's information. That's movement, matter, behavior. And that's energy. So this is the part that deals with what should we do. This is the part that deals with how should we do it, or the behavior. And that's the deal that, uh, part that deals with why, motive, what's the energy behind it, what supports this, okay? And that's the pattern of the universe. We've got information, matter, and energy. It's in the image of God. It's beautiful. Okay, let me show you some more fractals of this, just so that you can really get it home. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Look at this, the archangels. Gabriel, the one who brings information. Michael, the one, matter, behavior, warfare, movement. And unfortunately, also Hallel, or Lucifer, light, music, energy. The themes are there. All the threes have that pattern. One more. The three domains of mankind at the moment. We have science, religion, and art. Science determines the facts, the information. Religion and morality, the behavior. And art, the beautiful, or the energy, at what motivates and drives us. It's, it's there. Okay, this is God's pattern. I'm going to show it to you a little bit more. Look at the three sons of Noah. Japheth, 
the intellectual Europeans, Shem, the spiritual Mediterranean, Middle Eastern, Oriental group, and we have Ham, the physical group. It's the same fractal, the behavior, the focus. You can take it even further and further. The point that I want to make is we need to start looking at themes, not at details. We need to see pictures, not only the words. Okay, now, let me bring this together for you, which I hope will bless you. Our ability to have a relationship with the eternal creator is in relationship to our thoughts and is supported by our brain, nervous system and skin. Our ability to decide good and evil, right and wrong, influences our will and influences our behavior. Okay? And God even says, I judge the heart and kidneys. He refers to the mesoderm. It's a continuum. Our intuition, the experience of the spiritual, influences the experience of the emotional, influences our gut. We even use words, gut feel, for intuition. This is not new, it's only true. Okay? And in fact, in Hebrew, this was well understood. The same word for kidneys translates either conscience or kidneys. It's the same word. You should really go back to the original. It's beautiful. It's magnificent. Okay. Now, let me take it to the next step, because remember, I want to get from Garden of Eden to ICU. So I need to build a little bit of additional information here. <laughs> if this was what we became vulnerable to, what were we prior to this? Well, of course, we experienced perfect love in relationship. We were in rightful standing before God and ourselves and others. And instead of shame, we had honor. Now, stay with me for this next link, because this is key. If we experience love, we will embody the fruit of the Spirit consistent with love, which are love, joy, and peace. Those are relational, exchange, informational type entities. Can you see that? This has to do with relating. Now, if I've lost you there, watch the next one because that's even clearer. If we are in rightful standing, we will extend patience, meaning we will not act rashly. So our behavior is restrained for good. We will be functional, meaning, and this is the true word, tov, which means it works like it should work. We will do what we are meant to do, and in fact, we will go further than that. We will do deeds of loving kindness. This is all behavioral. If we're in right standing, our behavior will reflect that. And here's the last one. If we experience the honor of sons and daughters of God, we will be faithful, because we own everything with our Father. We will be gentle because there's no need to exert force. We know who we are. And we will express self-control, which is the vision or the, the picture of the word is a river running in its banks. It knows where it's going. It doesn't need to flood. That is the image. So love, righteousness, and honor produce the fruit of the Spirit. And here's the rub. When we are fallen... And we are operating in a world that is driven by fear, guilt, and shame. We produce the opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. And this is our broken world. Stay with me. Instead of love, joy, and peace produced by love, we have unlovingness, which means inability to receive or give love. Look at the nearest billboard with some cool individual giving you the sort of look. We admire that. Why? They're untouchable. Exactly. They're unloving. They have no relationship. Cool is unloving. It's not a picture of the body of Christ. Conflict and depression or sadness instead of love, joy, and peace. Instead of the righteousness and the deeds of righteousness, we now have impatience. See what happens when you're late for work. Suddenly you cross with everybody and impatient. Why? Because you feel guilty. Impatience is the fruit of guilt. You are unkind or dysfunctional because you no longer know what you should do. And you even become cruel rather than kind. And lastly, when honor turns to shame, we become unfaithful. And we recognize this in fallen communities that have a stigma of shame. How do we characterize them? We see them as unfaithful, we see them as harsh, and we see them as 
full of addictions and self-indulgence. It's the fruit of shame. It's the fruit of shame. So if I could summarize very complex theology, the fruit of the flesh is what comes out of fear, guilt, and shame. And we use it every day to motivate ourselves. I'm going to be late. So-and-so is going to be cross with me. What are people going to say? We use fear, guilt, and shame as our motivation. We have primed ourselves to function in this way. What does the fruit of the Spirit come from? When we do it in love, do it in right standing, and do it in honor as sons and daughters of God. Man, have we fallen, but we can be restored. And I hope that this reflects something so that we know where to start. Okay, now, let me take it through to disease. How does the curse causeless not come? Which is what it says, and the disease is a curse, so what is then the cause of disease? Well, here is a very simple overview. The fruit of our fear is born in our ectoderm. Mental disease, nervous conditions, dysfunctions of the regulation of the nervous system throughout the body, and skin diseases are fear-based. Different types of fear, but they are fear-based, and I'll prove it just now. Diseases of the mesoderm, and with that I include muscles, joints, cartilage, immune system, including cancers, uh, blood conditions, heart conditions, particularly coronary thrombosis, kidney conditions in many cases, are the product of guilt, and I'll show you the continuum in a moment. And finally, liver, lungs, and intestines bear the brunt of our lack of self-worth or shame. Let me prove that. I'll prove that to you shortly from Scripture. You actually already knew this. You perhaps didn't know you did. <laughs> it's more complex, of course, than just fear, guilt, and shame because there's interaction. Someone insults you and you respond in anger. So, you know, there are overlaps. But I want you to see the primary colors because it starts making it simpler to unravel people's problems and even identify your own. Now, is there evidence in science? Surprisingly, yes, but not only yes, they don't see it for what it is. The latest field in medical uh, technology and science is called psychoneuroimmunoendocrinology. Say that three times quickly. Okay. What, what does that mean? It means mind, brain, immune system, and endocrinology, and guess what? Ecto, meso, endoderm. They haven't seen it for what it is. It's already there. We want to take it another level because we want to talk about spirit, mind, and body as we were originally created. And the word we've used, you know, just to be fancy, is a Greek version of that, which is pneumopsychosomatology, PPS. Now, let me show you briefly, and I won't get through all the slides, but I want to leave you with some core truths. <laughs> We have a fear continuum, and I now want to bring the three levels of unrighteousness. The trait, in other words, what we might call the iniquity, is where your whole being has become fearful. In the Afrikaans, it's easy. Wherever you read ars or arts, sondarts, leonarts, dronkarts, okay, it means the nature has now joined that sin. Yeah, so that, so that is the, that's a giveaway, okay? So what we would describe as the fear continuum of iniquity would be when people are completely oppressed by fear. Now, I immediately say in compassion that many people through abuse and the sins of others have been brought into this condition. And for them to be healed, they need to release those things. So I don't want people to feel condemned by what I say. I want you to have the prospect of being freed. That's the most important. Then we've got what we might call state anxiety or a condition which means this prolonged tension, prolonged anxiety. Or, as we like to say, is, you know, I'm just slightly worried. You know, I, I think about it a lot. That is state anxiety. You are not fulfilling scripture that says, cast all your cares upon me. It's a violation of scripture and hence it is an unrighteousness or form of unrighteousness. And then the reaction, of course, we can't do anything about the fright. I mean, that's just, you know, that's reaction. But then we can decide what to do after that. And those actions may then be forms of omission or maybe failings. 
And what we find is there's more than enough, and I'm not going to dwell on the details, but there's more than enough medical support that this is how it works. And it distorts our physiology. And let me give you two examples. We know that fear and heart palpitations, in other words, irregular heartbeat, is, is linked. We know. So ectoderm fear is linked. In fact, let me show an extreme example. Just after the Twin Towers blew up, within the next three months, they monitored people with pacemakers in Florida, and the amount of pacemakers that were firing to try and keep people alive went up by 68% because they were living in fear. Who spoke about that? Luke, when he said, man's heart's failing them for fear, for looking after those things that are coming upon the earth, for the powers of heaven or earth will be shaken. I'm standing here 2,000 years later, and it's so profound that you said it's like Luke. Yes, I feel like it, you know. I want to confess the practice that we've had and just embrace the gospel in its fullness. And this is exactly the same as Luke already foretold. Let's look at the guilt continuum. In the guilt continuum, things like anger, rage, depression, which is basically anger without enthusiasm. <laughs> it's true. Re resentment, blame, wrath, vengeance, and bitterness. Now, the trait, the trait in this area, in other words, where your nature becomes like that, is when people are hostile. In all their dealings, they are angry. They are, you know, averse to the person they're dealing with. And we know these people. Maybe we have been those people. I know I was. The state is where we, in a prolonged state of anger, that often ends up as depression, and of course the reaction is that instantaneous burst of rage or wrath. What happens here, and our idioms are often smarter than our medicine, is that our blood literally boils. And what happens is that it starts clotting, which is why heart attacks go sore up when people are in, in rage. And there's inflammation. Our body declares war. We've got war in our soul, and our body has war within its members. And we see that as autoimmune disease when it turns against us. Bitterness turns into the joints very commonly, and cancer when it really festers and these feelings are locked down. So, and these are the genetic changes. I don't want to dwell on it, but there's well-known substantiation in science that hostility causes heart attacks to increase very, very significantly, apart from blood pressure and other things. This is a chromosome. I'm not going to dwell on the details. What we know is people who are hostile trim off the ends of their chromosomes, and once those tips are gone, it stops dividing. You are literally shortening the number of your days, as God's Word says. And when it reaches this stage, you're prone to cancer and all kinds of other problems. And it also affects your offspring. Stress at work, it's not just any stress that's bad. It's unjust stress. Yeah. And what unjust stress means, when the expectations are high, but your control is low, people are placing demands on you, but you cannot determine how to meet them. That is the sort of stress that kills. Or where you are working your butt off, but earning nothing. That, because, and you know, it makes people bitter, resentful, and it is wrongful. That's where the heart attacks and things come from. It's unjust stress. Let's uh, dwell lastly on the shame continuum. Embarrassment, shame, humiliation, unworthiness, poor self-image. The trait here is where people have a life of inferiority, where they just have a shameful existence. The state is where they have a prolonged state of a sense of shame, and the reaction, of course, would be in, a, for instance, a social setting where someone experiences embarrassment and their skin flushes and so on. The mechanisms are complicated, but the one thing I do want to tell you is that the HIV virus, and maybe I'll dwell on that briefly, the HIV virus actually climbs into the body through a mechanism that is supposed to be covered by a sense of fulfillment. I'm oversimplifying. The bottom line is, if we honor or create a community that honors people with HIV, that is probably the most effective anti-HIV agent we could dispense. Honor will block the entry of the virus. Honor will preserve the CD4 because VIP, which is the substance, VIP actually preserves the life of the CD4 cells. They need love and honor, not condemnation and latex. Okay. Okay, give them the latex too, you know, while they're still unrepentant. 
Okay, just briefly, one condition, irritable bowel syndrome. These are the people that have the squats and the shots and the you know, constipation intermittently. Um, it's a very common condition, the squats, absolutely. And what we have found uniquely as the spiritual root is a fear of abuse. Fear of abuse, sexual, physical, verbal, or emotional. You walk into a meeting, you think you're going to get chewed on, that's where your symptoms jump up. It's a fear of abuse, and that's why one has to deal with that underlying shame and the sense of who you are, rather than popping pills for the rest of your life and wondering when your gut is going to let you down yet again. Viruses don't just hop on board. There are specific areas where the viruses lock on and go in. If we are in a state of despair, we literally are waving cellular wands for viruses to attach to. That's why hopeful expectation and gratitude is essential for our lives. It literally is an antiviral. Hopeful expectation and gratitude. Right, now what does scripture say? And this is just to confirm what I've mentioned before. The first pattern of disease in scripture is this. Leviticus 26, if you hate me in various forms, don't listen, don't obey, don't absorb into your soul what I have taught you. The consequences are this, terror, consumption, and the burning egg. Do nothing, drying up, and burning up. Okay, stay with me. Do nothing, drying up, burning up. Deuteronomy 28 takes it to the next level. It says, you're going to be hot, really hot, really burning. You're going to be really unsafe. Blasting, thin green line, which by the way, that green is associated with shame, if you look at the root word. Those are extensions of shame, which is drying up. Madness, blindness, and astonishment of heart means that you're paralyzed. You can do nothing. So again, burn up, dry up, do nothing. Okay, but this is the, under the law. You know, this is in the old covenant. You know, does this have anything to do with us today? Yes, it does. John 15. If you are not in me, you can do nothing. You will dry up and you will burn up. If we do not join what Christ represents, then we are under the exact same consequences as the children of Israel in the wilderness. It's the same continuum. That's what I really admire about the Word of God. From Genesis to Revelation, 66 books, 44 authors, no change. Same story, same God. So it is violations of what I have called the law of love that brings on the physical illnesses. Because you know what? Do nothing is an ectoderm problem. Burning up is a mesoderm problem. And drying up is an endoderm problem. It maps exactly. And in fact, you knew this because in Ephesians 6, Paul says, Put on the helmet of salvation. Why? Because if you have an eternal security, you are protected against fear. The helmet protects your brain, the organ of your ectoderm. Salvation is the antidote to fear. Righteousness is against the guilt, right? It protects the mesodermal organ of the heart and the kidneys. It's righteousness. And the belt of truth who tells you that you are sons and daughters of the living God, protects your endoderm. Wow. You knew this all along. I want to honor you that you are the representatives of God's word. You are the royal priesthood. You do have something to say to a broken world and a broken body. And I want to honor you that you have access to the truth. And I want to submit what science has produced to you to be able to dispense in wisdom for the restoration of the body. I almost feel like ending there because it's so important that I leave you with that deposit. Yes, we say that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. He promises it if we walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. What does that mean? It means, and this is in Galatians, it means that if we work faith through love, then we are walking in the Spirit then we are not under the law. Then we are not subject to doing nothing, to drying up and to burning up. I want to end with maybe just giving you a few tools so that you have something to take back to your congregations. I want to start by maybe just mentioning God's model, God's plan for healing. What was God's plan for healing all along? 
Well, you know, we start thinking of oil and prayer and so on, but the first example you probably haven't even realized, and it's so beautiful to me, it's the story of Abraham and Abimelech. Sarah is beautiful at 100. They go into the land of the Philistines. Abimelech checks her out, takes her into the harem. A mysterious disease falls over them. In the rabbinical teaching, it was probably a venereal disease because they didn't come near any female during that time. So Abimelech was down under. And God appears to him in a dream. God appears to him in a dream, says, you've got another man's wife. You better return or you're dead. Abimelech says, I'm sorry, I didn't know. God says, that's right, it's a sin. Don't make it a transgression because then you're dead. You didn't know. Now you do. Fix it. So next day, Sarah coins camels and promises. He goes to Abraham, says, well, here's everything. Didn't touch your wife. Everything's restored. But you lied to me. Abraham says, yes, I did. This is why I thought you'd slit my throat for Sarah. So they make up. Abraham prays for Abimelech. And here it says, he prayed for him and Abimelech was healed. And in context, you'll see it's of infertility. His wife, his maid servants, and they bore children. Now, here's the key, because we don't read the next verse. The next verse is, and the Lord visited Sarah, and she conceived. Confess your faults one to another, so that you may be healed. That's the pattern. Look at Job. After all this misery of God putting on the line, can a created being love me unconditionally? That's the big story. Not how the devil can, can fluff you up. Is can a created being love me unconditionally? And at the end of that story in the misery where God says, Job, you didn't know who I am. This is who I am. Job says, I'm sorry I didn't know. And then watch this. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. When he prayed for his friends. So, yes, elders, yes, prayer, yes, oil, yes, the name of the Lord, but confess your faults one to another. Why? So that your shame under the fig leaf of pride is brought to the light and your honor can be restored. Healing is always relational. And Matthew 18 gives us a couple of important verses. One is, if you do not forgive. In other words, God cannot take what you will not release. We have to forgive in order to be forgiven. Now, it is important that we realize there's a difference between fellowship and forgiveness. If someone is dangerous, you don't invite them to Sunday dinner. Okay, there's a difference and that's what this plucking of hands and eyes and things is. It means when your salvation, which includes your physical health, is in jeopardy, you cannot fellowship. But that is not the same as living in unforgiveness. Forgiveness is required. Now that's of course, forgiveness is required from the person who's wronged. The person who wrongs can't just say, ach, excuse me, it's jammer. No. They have to say, I'm so sorry, I want to make it up to you. How can I do that? How can I make amends? That's the attitude. That's the principle of Scripture. Not just shrugging and saying, you've got to forgive me, you're a Christian. Which unfortunately is so sad and very common. So we have to distinguish those two. And that's one of the main problems in the body of Christ. We confuse forgiveness and fellowship issues. Now how do I apply this in my life? That's the buttons the enemy pushes. This is our response. Think of Christ in Gethsemane. Oh, this is all coming upon me. What do I do? Though he slay me, I will trust him. That is our response. Yes, we'll experience fear as Christ did. But we have to cling to that salvation and that trust. That's the only thing that will help you. That's why you cannot slay fear at the level of the soul. It's overcome at the level of the spirit. In terms of our sense of guilt, we have to submit not only to God's law, but also to His way to restore relationship. That's the pathway. And to humble ourselves rather than stay in shame so that He may raise us up at the appointed time as His uh, sons and daughters that we are uh, into the level of glory that we will resume. Okay. This is... Just confirming that from Proverbs, we must trust, submit, and humble ourselves. 
We need to humble ourselves before God. We need to fix our relationships as far as we are able. And we need to leave the past in the past. Self-pity and unforgiveness are the two barriers that I have come across in ministry that are insurmountable unless the person's willing to change. If they're stuck in the identity of their disease and if they're unwilling to forgive, it's game over. And you can love them and you can try and disciple them, but there's no breakthrough. These are some of the ways in which being health teaches scripture. It's too much for me to dwell on now. There is some more literature at the back if you'd like to look at some of the resources we have. One thing I want to bless you with, and it's taken from the book of James where it says there are steps to sin. And I want to release you today that a thought is not a sin and an emotion is not a sin until you agree with it. Until you agree with it. This is so important because many of us are condemned by thoughts. Say, How can I think that and call myself a son of God? If you are disagreeing, it is not your thought. You've taken it captive. That's what we're told to do. So that's so important that I release you that until you agree and behave in agreement, you have not sinned, you have been tempted. Big difference. I hope it releases you. In conclusion, this famous verse in Revelation 12, they overcame him with the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. The blood of the lamb for our guilt, the word of our testimony for our shame, and loving God more than our own lives is how we overcome fear. May you be blessed in applying these truths and finding a different way to think about it and maybe having an opportunity to talk to someone in disease, not saying you've sinned, but to say, who hurt you? What happened? How can we bring you back into the relationship that will produce healing on its own? Father, we thank you for this time. We want to thank you for the way in which you've just really given me additional time for a lot of slides, and I just hope that everybody has received what they came to receive, that the seeds have fallen on fertile uh, soil, uh, if anything I said offended or if anything was uh, of, of a uh, source of confusion, uh, Lord, I just ask that you through your spirit will continue to nurture and lead so that we don't condemn, we console, and that we lead people into truth, that we don't uh, stay in our state of bondage and ignorance, but that we realize that our diseases are really telling us the keys towards resuming the abundant life that you always promised. And we thank you that we can ask this of you in Jesus' name. Amen.